well. So in, enjoying the weather, um, brilliant. Um, and and really, I'm really pleased to be welcoming everybody here. And um, this event re was established because the, the advanced medicine sector is growing. Um, and, and in the last two years, the turnover uh, of UK industry in this sector has tripled to 3 million and employs 3,000 people. And there's seven reimbursed therapies available to patients, and that's tripled in the last two years as well. And the number of clinical trials has doubled. And in fact, the UK is a, is a leading light in, in this sector with 12% of the global clinical trials. So this kind of kicked off a question with the facilities that are available in, in Northern Ireland um, and, and really how can we respond to this need? So uh, today we've got a fantastic panel drawn from across the universities and um, the commercial space in Northern Ireland and also beyond. So welcome to the panel and I'll just uh, run through them. So we've got Francesca uh, Gliebick, who's director of the London Advanced Therapies Network, uh, Professor Danny McCauley, uh, who's professor and consultant um, of uh, in intensive care medicine at the Royal Victoria Hospital and Queen's University of Belfast and clinical lead of the QUB Clinical Cell Therapy Facility. Professor Tara Moore, who's Professor of Personalised Medicine and Chair at Ulster University uh, and, and is Chief R&D Officer as well for Avellino Lab, so a dual role there. Um, Dr Christina O'Neill, who's CEO of Vasquesa, um, which is a cell therapy spin out uh, in Northern Ireland, um, and Professor Alan Stitt, um, who's Dean of Innovation and Impact and the Macaulay Chair of Experimental Ophthalmology at Queen's. And we also have uh, Christopher Good, who's the Cell and Gene Therapy Logistics Director at Biocare, and he's going to provide some insights, it, sorry, some insights, because uh, they're a specialist uh, global courier firm with 30 years experience in pharma, biotech and the life sciences sector. So welcome to Christopher as well. Uh, and they've kindly sponsored this session. So, so thank you for that. Um, so um, really, I think it, in order to understand how we how we might be res responding to this need in advanced therapies, uh, I think we need to hear from from Danny, uh, if I can come to you first, so, um, really to, to introduce what we have here in, in Northern Ireland, the clinical cell therapy facility, uh, and also some of the great work that you've been doing uh, in this area uh, uh, recently. Thanks, Joy. Um, and I guess many thanks for organising and, and the invite to speak. Um, the Cell Therapy Facility has been a, a labour of love uh, for, um, I guess, you know, probably almost five years now. And it's taken us a, a bit of time to get it established. Um, but I think one of the challenges that I've had is uh, um, advertising its presence and, and making sure that people are aware of it. And I think, you know, events such as this are, are um, really important. Um, so really much appreciated uh, for, for organizing. I guess um, the first thing I would say is um, the, the cell therapy facility is a um, joint endeavor uh, with the Belfast Trust. Um, so uh, essentially um, several years ago, um, we submitted to uh, the MRC infrastructure call and were successful in getting funding uh, for the cell therapy facility. Um, and it's co-funded by the MRC, um, Queen's itself, and uh, the uh, HSC RMD. And although it's um, the, you know, embedded within the, the Belfast Trust and um, you know, QUB have been uh, sort of leading, setting it up, I really would emphasize, you know, in my mind, this is a regional facility um, and we would want to work with all partners, both academic and, uh, and industrial, if we can. Um, so I think that would be my uh, first um, major comment. So um, essentially we have started um, reasonably uh, small in our um, ambition to, to get something done. So we, we have capacity for the storage of ATMPs, manipulation um, for administration to patients and uh, clinical trial expertise. And we have a, a large investment in the infrastructure and equipment to do more than that. So at the minute, um, we, we do not do production of um, personalized cells. So we, we, we don't 
isolate and grow. We we tend to take IMP from or cell therapy from other um, providers and uh, use almost the cell therapy as a hub to facilitate cell therapy trials within um, Northern Ireland. And the history behind that is we had initially planned to uh, go to the MHRA to get uh, an, uh, an addition to the uh, MHRA license to allow manufacturing. Um, but it's interesting at that time, there was a, a real um, shortage of staff within Northern Ireland and identifying uh, a production manager with cell therapy facility um, was challenging. So uh, that led us to um, move to a, a sort of a, a thera cell therapy facility where we have a, a pharmacist that, that leads the cell therapy uh, facility supported um, by uh, the staff that exist within the Belfast Trust. And as I just uh, mentioned, I should have said this earlier, that the cell therapy facility is embedded within Victoria Pharmaceuticals in the Belfast Trust. And Victoria Pharmaceuticals is a manufacturing pharmacy. So it's actually quite unique that we have um, a cell therapy facility within a manufacturing pharmacy. So we're, we're really strong on the, uh, the GMP aspects of, of managing the ATMP. And I guess the area where we need to grow is in the production uh, capacity. Um, so I mean, that's a brief uh, summary. I, I guess I see um, Sam Cameron is on the call as well. Sam um, is the production manager for uh, Victoria Pharmaceuticals and has been instrumental along with many of the other staff at uh, Victoria Pharmaceuticals in, in enabling this to happen. If we hadn't have embedded it within uh, Victoria, I, I don't think we would have uh, ever been successful in getting a cell therapy facility uh, up and running. So their infrastructure has been really key to the delivery. So I'll, I'll maybe stop there. That's a, I don't want to talk for too much. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention the, the other research activity that we have in relation to respiratory failure, but I'll maybe stop there. Um, Joanne, and see if there's any questions around the, the cell therapy facility. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Danny. And, and I should have said at, at the start, actually, if you'd like, if there are any questions, please jot them down into the chat and also feel free to introduce yourselves as well. Um, if you want to link to other people who you can see on the call, uh, I think you can private message as well. But if there are questions, please jot them in the chat or, or um, uh, uh, raise your hand uh, and you can ask them personally as well. So I'm assuming we, so there aren't any questions at the moment, but thank you, um, Danny. Uh, I think I think that's really interesting. And you've sort of highlighted something I think that we'll come back to later is about the availability of the skills sets within Northern Ireland. And, and perhaps that's something that uh, some of the other panel members can comment on. Uh, uh, I'm particularly interested to hear, you know, what what's missing? What do we need? Um, so, um, we would be interested, I think, to hear about about some of your successes in the trials. But what I'd like to do, I think, is to move on um, to uh, Christina. Uh, so Christina O'Neill is the CEO of Aspersa, which is a spin out uh, from um, Queen's University uh, and just been developing a novel cell therapy for, for blood vessel regeneration. And um, Christina, I think it would be really interesting. Obviously, please do introduce your technology, but it'd be great to understand, you know, what what's the story? What what what? Uh, how does a, a new startup uh, manage, uh, you know, to, to get the facilities that they need and, and the skills that they need? So it'd be really uh, interesting to hear, you know, how you've done um, and also tell us, you know, some of the plans you've got where, with the Innovate UK money that you've successfully been awarded. So over to you, uh, Christina. Thank you, Joanne. So um, we are, Vast Versa is a brand new spin-out company um, from Queen's University in Belfast. And I am, my name is Christina O'Neill, I'm the CEO. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce the company, Joanne. And it's really going to be a great um, opportunity to connect with everyone in the space today. So Vast Versa provides a unique cell therapy for blood vessel regeneration. And really it's to meet an unmet clinical need. So our vision is to create the next generation of living advanced therapies using our innovative Angiosite technology. So our first product is called Angiosite and really it targets ischemic diseases. 
um, where there's inadequate blood perfusion and vascular insufficiency. And angiocyte cell therapy creates new blood vessels to repair tissue, improve circulation and promote wound healing. And here you can see an example of some of the blood vessels formed by angiocyte in red. If you can just go on to the next slide, please. So yeah, this is my final slide. So really, I just wanted to highlight our position to date. So there's been over a decade worth of academic research to create angiocyte technology. And I successfully completed the eye care program. And this really, this competition really gave us a chance to, to actually go out and perform um, really, really extensive market research all over the world, really, to, to test our idea of whether there was a need for our technology. So following on from that um, and the successful pitch, we then applied for Innovate UK grant funding. And we were successful in, in being awarded this. And then after that, there's there's only Innovate UK will only give you 70%. So there's a, a match funding requirement. So a match funding requirement for an additional 30%. So we then had to go out and look for um, the match funding for that. And we were successful in getting the match funding for the Innovate UK funding, as well as securing a little bit of additional seed funding for the company. So Joanne asked me to really highlight some of the the challenges, I guess, that we've we faced um, spinning out this company. So I guess the first one to highlight would really be the funding. So for us, we find it, it was really quite difficult to find the right type of investor, because if you can imagine our cell therapy, you know, there's a lot of there's many years in research and development and preclinical data that we need to go through. So it's going to take a long time. And a lot of investors are, are most likely looking for a quick return on their on their investment. So I think finding the right type of investor to realize that, you know, cell therapy isn't isn't going to be returns in a few years has been has been quite difficult. And um, the other issue is the lab space. So as a new company, Basque Versa, we simply just don't have the funds to, you know, set up our own lab and their own equipment and everything else. So. At the minute, we've had to um, work out of the university facilities and we will have to do that um, probably for over the next few years. Um, so I'm also aware that in Northern Ireland, there's there's a general lack of available wet lab space. And um, so it would be great if if we could, you know, find new ways to see if there's any more potential and any more space available for companies such as as vice versa. And then another challenge for me anyway was because I have been a postdoc for, for 10 years. So making the move from academia to, to lead a company um, has been a real challenge. And, I, you know, there's been quite a few things that I've learned along the way. And I'm, I'm still learning, to be honest. So it's really just trying to build a support network around you to try and make sure that you have the skills um, to be able to lead this, this new company. And then lastly, um, one of the things um, that I'm also aware of is I know Danny was just chatting there about the, the facilities, the cell um, therapy facilities at the Royal Victoria. But currently, in terms of manufacturing our cells and our product, we, we can't do that in Northern Ireland. So there's a lack of a manufacturing facility in Northern Ireland currently at the minute. So there may be some of the, the key challenges that I see from from a very early stage spin out company from the university. So I'll just I'll just end there, trying because I know we're short for time. <laughs> um, thanks, Christina, and 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 that was really nicely put as well about the challenges. And um, uh, I think there's some things that we can address um, uh, in Northern Ireland here. But I'd be really interested to hear um, from uh, our next speaker. I think Francesca as she as you explain uh, about the London Advanced Therapies Network actually you know how can we develop specialist investor networks is there access to additional investor networks um, across uh, in in the rest of the UK uh, and and also um, you know what are your experiences I, I think of being part of the network and being able to access some of that sort of translational and commercialization expertise and so um, that that would be really useful to understand as well um, so yeah Francesca if you if it'd be great if you could come in here and, and answer some of those questions with your with your talk as well thank you 
Uh, yes, sure. Thank you for inviting me and uh, I can bring a little bit the London experience. Um, so London Advanced Therapies is uh, a, a network that was established in 2018 uh, following a research England call for proposal for connecting um, in the Connecting Capability Fund. So the Connecting Capability Fund just basically, I wouldn't say answer um, uh, is the answer and solution to the problem is just highlighted, but uh, is trying to help with that because basically it's a fund aimed at um, bringing together university that have uh, either complementary expertise or even just uh, the same expertise uh, repeated, but uh, with the concept that by working together you really make uh, uh, more than the sum of the parts. And uh, and I think the uh, underlying concept of when the Connecting Capability Fund was established was that uh, by really um, in encouraging university to work together, the whole of UK will, will benefit. So a group of academics from Imperial College, uh, UCL, uh, University College London and King's College London applied for the fund and the concept was quite simple, establish a team uh, of knowledge exchange practitioners, but also have uh, some funds to organize activities that really bring together the um, academic community. And um, the, the main activities that we uh, engaged in was uh, um, mapping of expertise. So interestingly, when I read a few days ago um, the original application and one of the cases that was made uh, for the funding was that uh, an early analysis from MedCity identified that there were more than 60 researchers in London working in the field of cell engine therapy. We run our uh, mapping expertise and we actually have uh, 230 PIs uh, uh, working in the area. Maybe some are more junior than they counted before, but I do think that uh, a detailed mapping give you an idea of really the, the strength you have. And, uh, and then we, we run, as always, when you want to bring people together, nothing works as the possibility of funding. So we run two funding pro um, um, pro uh, proposals, one to connect universities. So it's uh, um, scientists from two different universities to work together collaboratively. And uh, it was important that they shouldn't have worked together before. So the panel was quite strict in looking if the two PIs uh, bringing forward the proposal had uh, published together many times in the past. They were instantly non-eligible because this was really about creating new collaboration and bring together new expertise. And then a fund to support SMEs in working with London universities. Um, the, uh, the other thing we did was uh, create um, um, some contracts to facilitate uh, the um, contracts resolution. But more importantly, um, and I say this because what we did with the contracts was nothing um, particularly special. We really started from the template that we all know have been around for forever, the Brunswick, the Lambert, and then um, adapted to the projects. But we really uh, created a best practice of working together. So the team, instead of uh, trying to negotiate the contract on behalf of the university, really worked with the university departments to negotiate with and for them and really to help them um, resolve any issue that arose. And uh, we could see in this process of uh, linking up industries with uh, universities, the value of having a robust uh, mapping of expertise because uh, when we ran the first um, call for programs, um, we tried to match fund uh, industry and expertise, but it took time, which left a really little time then to the partner to write their, their own proposals. The second time we had the mapping done, which really allowed us to identify the possible experts within one hour or two from the request. And uh, we made the, the matchmaking was done most, much more efficiently, which uh, then led to better propose, proposals. So the um, success rate on the second time round was much, much higher. I think almost 80% of the projects were deemed uh, um, fundable, while the first time around the success rate was a, a third, because it was quite clear that 
um, the two partners were not real, you know, they had not built the relationship yet and the proposal was a bit disjoint. Um, this basically what I described here is the package of work that London Therape uh, Therapies was funded for. But what uh, then we tried to do, and uh, I think this is the, the most important uh, outcome of the, of the initiative, is that uh, we really started trying to bring together the academics um, to work together when there are proposals or to decide the best strategy together. And one example is uh, the Medical Research Council launched the um, gene therapy hubs, uh, the MRC and Life Arc gene therapy hubs. And uh, we within London um, decided together what to do. And uh, for instance, there were opportunities to, for UCL and Kings to work together, but then we decided shape two different partnerships because the the cap limit from the funding was set at a certain level and uh, by working together we and by knowing each other and trusting each other we are able to respond much more rapidly to uh, funding opportunities to opportunities from um you know, interacting with companies and uh, going to um, your specific issues of, um, for instance, lack of either expertise or sometimes uh, uh, lab space. Uh, one thing I'm trying to do is really, and you know, it, it, I don't think it's so it's easy as it sounds, but uh, um, the sharing of space uh, when it's possible. So I'm trying to promote a, a culture where um, there is staff exchange. So in, in the extension that I just submitted the, the, on which uh, Hirani is mentioned as a partner for the future where we try and bring together. Um, I really, uh, you know, I, the, um, we, we want um, is, um, staff exchange, expertise exchange to be um, to be promoted and to become much more easily. So in my dream scenario would be a, a place where in few years, uh, if someone in Belfast has uh, um, a problem with the space and needs some space or a collaboration, maybe they can find in London or in Manchester someone that can borrow a, a lab bench or something for a while, a, a GMP facility. And um, so this is really, I think the most important message is this kind of ethos. We are trying to build the working collaborative ethos whereby the different regions within the UK try and help each other. And, and thank, thank you, Francesca. And, and just in case um, people on the line missed it, so Francesca's putting in, uh, I've just submitted a, a bid to expand the network outside of London, and that's to encompass all the regions. Is that, is that correct? And that is correct. Uh, because um, so, um, and I have, I'm very thankful to Joan for your help with this. Um, at the beginning of August, we were told by Research England that award holders could uh, apply for an extension. And uh, already before that, that I had started working with uh, the Southwest um, Advanced Therapies Network, and we were actually wondering how we could do things together without any funding, because uh, we, we were keen on helping each other with, uh, for instance, organizing seminars. And, uh, and then the opportunity came, and to me, um, and I have to say to all the leads in London, the most, uh, the most exciting thing, then the most, you know, almost um, obvious thing to do was not to continue with London Advanced therapies but you've gone on mute <laughs> you're still you're still on mute Francesca you've muted somehow yes ah. I, I saw a message that some someone muted me <laughs> um, so I was saying that uh, um, for us the most uh, exciting and uh, kind of obvious thing was not to continue with London advanced therapies but to try and build what we call a network of networks so every um, so there is no desire here to have an expansion of London advanced therapies and to say, you know, we we, we just grew and um, uh, cover it all, but uh, um, to try and link the different networks that have been created. So um, I called it a UK collaborative uh, or a network of networks. 
and uh, hopefully if we are funded we will be working together and organizing um, joint seminars uh, and the concept is uh, that we we are we try to describe in the proposal was that uh, um, for instance uh, in, in in the seminars activities that we would organize together uh, we would have uh, every region in terms would own a seminar to make sure that every region is given the prominence and the publicity and um, and basically what we think is that uh, if we as UK really bring together the expertise, work together, facilitate, make it easier for company to uh, be spun out and stay in the UK rather than going to the US. And if we make it easier, for instance, to have um, access to academic manufacturer for lentivirus or AV, um, the business, this business will stay in UK. This is what we want to do. We want to make sure that doesn't happen what happened with the antibodies uh, business. Uh, you know, we, we were at the forefront of the science of the development, but then the, the money were made elsewhere, if I have to speak in a very crude way. And um, this is it. <laughs> OK, no, and, and, and I think that's a very clear message um, and hopefully we can learn from that lesson. And um, if I can speak on behalf of, of, the, of this region, I think we'd be very keen to join up, even even if that isn't funded. I think if there are chances where we can hold joint seminars or, or collaborate, if there is a silver lining from from this pandemic is perhaps people aren't looking to travel, but we can organise joint seminars to share expertise and, and, and um, you know, develop those relationships. Exactly. This is, I have to say that this is what we were considering, for instance, with the Southwest before the funding call uh, came to us, uh, because uh, the organising a seminar like this one, it's, um, it's not expensive at all. It's only a matter of uh, the, the, the organizing it and we can provide help with that even if you would own the, the seminar and um, with uh, advanced therapies network we run few uh, seminars with uh, south korea or with japan attended by hundreds of people and uh, it worked amazingly well i was very worried the first time around but uh, so we we abs i mean i hope we get some funding but if we don't there are so many things we can still work to um, together um, for free, let's say. <laughs> and, and, and that's fantastic. And I think that's something that, that Harani can work with you to, to help bridge to, across here. So um, and that, that's fantastic. Um, thank you, Francesca. Um, I'd like to bring um, Tara Moore uh, in at this point because sort of Francesca sort of talked about homegrown startups and, and homegrown opportunities. But Tara, if you, as you've got your dual role with Avelino, which is a uh, um, a US West Coast company. It'll be interesting to, to contrast what are their opportunities to, to collaborate um, in this space and, and you know what are the uh, the resources or the relationships that we need to develop to, to bring this forward. Yeah, thank you, Joanne, and thank you for to Arani for organizing this. Um, I feel like a bit of an amateur talking about this after Francesca. <laughs> Um, I'm probably in quite early days. Um, comments from Danny and Christina totally resonate with me so far in terms of our experience in trying to advance the gene therapy. And as Danny said, these things are often a labour of love. They're an individual who's been driving forward a specific research topic for maybe five, ten years of their lives before it reaches a stage where we can even reach out to an industrial partner. And we often have very small research groups. So I think the main problems is uh, is visibility and visibility around industrial partners to allow us to get industrial funding to move it forward so it can be commercialized. I think I was lucky. Um, I had a partner sort of diagnostic company from South Korea, as you say, in, in, located in the USA, who were interested in this rare disease, this eye blindness that I was working on. And really no one else in Big Pharma was interested in putting money into it or was even interested in what we were doing in Ulster. I think Ulster facilitated my experience because they were very forward thinking in terms of industrial partners and uh, research and impact were very quick to put up the, the various agreements and licensing agreements. Um, the challenges I'd say in my experience to date is definitely has been skills, be that, be that just skills in the area of gene therapy, stem cell replacement, anything like that, right up to regulatory and those types of uh, all that advice that we needed. 
Um, for certain production pipelines, which have already been mentioned in GMP facilities, we're going to end up outsourcing it all out of Northern Ireland, as well as a lot of the toxicology and some of the very specialist studies I need to do in eyes. I will have to CRO that out because, to contract research places because I can't really get it done here. And I noticed with the FDA, when we go so far with their application, they won't let us progress any, fo any more into phase one, phase two, because they always kick back and say, you don't have a production pipeline in place, and we don't want to raise expectations of patients that this is going to reach a clinical trial and reach a, a medicine. Um, I think a challenge we have here is lab space, and I know Christina mentioned that. Um, definitely, we would need to be able to access Speaking from Avellino, from a, a USA company, want them to come over here and invest millions in FDI, an appropriately equipped lab and a lab space. And I notice even during the pandemic, I've been asked to do a lot of different pieces of work for the government and for other companies to look at antibodies and lateral flow devices. We really need to be pop, able to pop in and out of facilities like that and almost on a rental basis, where if there's Category three facilities or GMP facilities, we can we can access that and really use the skills that we have here in Northern Ireland. You know, I felt that was missing even during the pandemic. Never mind the longer kind of process that I have ahead of me of years of moving the therapy that we want to move with gene editing and siRNA. I think we're fortunate that we've partnered recently with SciStaff, and they've had that experience. You know that. They know what's involved, and I've found that has helped us a lot. So key partners and being, and being willing to collaborate uh, has made a big difference with us. And thank you, Tara. Uh, and I think that there's some important lessons to learn. I, I'm just interested to hear, did, did you seek out the Avellino partnership or th because they were working in it? or or they Because to try and establish some of these industry relationships is quite challenging. Uh, and I think maybe the only opp opportunity is conferencing, which has obviously been impacted because everything's gone online to so that networking. Have you got any thoughts or anyone else, uh, if you want to raise your hand, on, on how we can develop these relationships with, with specialist companies? I think uh, it's a visibility. And I suppose we were very proactive in publishing and, and getting papers out quickly. And those papers then gained attention and people then tend to to scan, they, they use people to scan and find what's new in the CRISPR area, what's new in this field. And I was just really lucky. They had partner diagnostics for this particular disease in the eye, and they weren't even a therapeutic company, but mm -hmm. to go through IPO, they decided to add this kind of pipeline of therapeutics to try and increase their worth. So I was, I was just fortunate, but for others, definitely visibility. OK, thank you, Tara. And I think I think that's something that uh, hopefully well, Harani will be able to help with. And, and it's a, a lesson, I think, that we need to uh, think about how we project externally some of the capabilities and opportunities um, and and join some of those wider networks. So I, I think that will come. Um, I think it's time, Joanna, the more time we spend in Northern Ireland, I think we're all really modest. Yes, <laughs> I agree. We, we just tend to hide everything that we do or we tend to think it's not good enough or it's not world leading. And sometimes it's a bit of an eye opener to be approached by people and, and asked to do things for them. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're too modest as well. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have to say, I, I can agree. You've got to, you know, hopefully, um, you know, I'm, I would be keen to help uh, making sure that everyone knows what what you do. And I know little myself or, you know, um, aside from the introduction John has made, uh, it's yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for adding that, Francesca. I I'm going to pause here. Um, are there any questions? Anybody uh, have anything that they want to ask the panelists so far uh, before I, I guess I mo move on to the next piece? Alan, would, if you'd like to. Sure, I was maybe just going to follow up on what Danny was talking about in terms of the capability around clinical trials, certainly in cell therapy, but also in gene therapy. And it, it strikes me sometimes that I think Northern Ireland um, with, with activities in our two universities and also in our trusts actually has some areas of real strength 
that we could probably harness a little bit more, especially in the context of, of cell and gene therapy. You know, Tara talked about eye disease, and I think, and I, I, I probably have a some well a bias in this. I, I clearly have a bias in this as an ophthalmology <laughs> researcher myself. But you know, the eye in many ways does represent a, a, a tissue system which is right at the very cutting edge of cell and gene therapy. Um, and, and I think, you know, what we have in Northern Ireland is an area of strength, both basic science and also clinical expertise, not least around clinical trials. And it, it does strike me that this is something that we should probably try to flag. You know, we have some clinical academics who are experts in clinical trials in some of these really important diseases in the in the posterior segment of the eye and also the anterior segment. And I, I think that perhaps if we can join the dots, we might be able to attract commercial partners to help deliver some of these cutting edge trials, making use of their expertise, but also making use of the cell therapy facility at the, at the, at the Victoria. Yeah, agreed, Alan. I think it's really useful to highlight and, and, and hopefully one of the outputs of this um, will be, you know, some further focus on some of those areas of strength. Um, so thank you. Um, at this point, I think it, it would be great to hear um, from Christopher Good uh, at Biocare. So obviously all of the pieces, uh, the moving parts are not in place for um, the our cell and gene therapy uh, sector over here in Northern Ireland or even uh, potentially in the UK, you still need to move samples around. Um, so I think it, it would be um, really interesting to, to discuss some of the logistics support that Biocare can provide for some of these time and temperature samples in the supply chain. And perhaps if you can reflect on, on the complex challenges that your clients face um, in this particular sector. Hey, thank you, Joanne, and thank you, Hirani, for the opportunity to, to speak to everyone now. Uh, my name's Christopher Good. I'm the Director of Cell and Gene Therapy Logistics at Biocare. Uh, Biocare is a uh, specialist logistics provider and we're dedicated only to the pharmaceutical, biotechnology and uh, life sciences se sectors. Um, we've been operating for approximately 35 years. Uh, could you move this slide to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so I joined the company in 2002. Um, during this time, worked with many um, sort of global companies delivering innovative to their specialist logistics needs. Um, these include design and implementation of bespoke packaging, as well as building and managing complex global supply chains. Um, been working with um, or in the cell and gene sector for a number of years, but sort of wholly dedicated to it now for the, the past sort of year and a half to two years. Um, I'm personally based in Cambridge in the UK and lead the global team to develop and provide the best in class solutions and services to provision of, sorry, for the provision of cell and gene uh, therapy logistics services. Um, we handle um, cell and gene therapy logistics from sort of preclinical development right through to both clinical and commercial stages. Um, the Biocare network spans more than 850 locations um, in over 160 countries across Europe, Africa, Asia and Americas. And we work to GDP standards across our network of global offices. Um, specifically within the island of Ireland, uh, Biocare has worked with various companies and leading academic institutions, including Almac, Radisson's Diagnostics and Queen's University of Belfast, uh, supporting them with their temperature controlled and time sensitive materials to various locations around the world. If you could uh, move the slide on please Joanne. Okay so I just want to talk a little bit about here about what what makes Biocare different. Um, so one of the key things really is that um, around our bespoke solution design. So we we don't treat um, or we treat each shipment as a, an individual shipment and design the the optimal solution from the ground up. We don't um, sort of force things into um, into uh, standardised ways if 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 they if they won't fit into those standardised ways. And obviously a clear um, need to do this is is to really understand what the uh, the product needs, what the client's needs are, what the, the clinic's needs are. So we have uh, certain processes um, around this to make sure we can get this information correct. And this is really around our, our contract review process. This may be on an individual shipment um, level or on a, a study or even commercial level. Um, we another key differentiator is that we have uh, dedicated focus teams. We don't operate call centers. So the person that you uh, call up um, will be the person who will understand your shipment and, and be able to help you out straight away. I think that's a, a key thing um, rather than sort of getting through to, to a, a general call center that is, is really uh, makes us stand out in the market at the moment. 
um, because we've been working in um, specialist logistics sector for uh, well nearly 35 years, um, all the shipments that we um, work with are uh, provide a white glove service, and that really has paved the way now for the thousands of shipments um, that we, we handle each year related to cell and gene therapy and all of the specialities that, that they require. Uh, if you could please uh, move the slide on again, Joanne. Thank you. So this slide really is just to um, reference a, a couple of uh, different areas um, that, that are important and when moving cell and gene therapy materials and obviously can cause uh, more complex issues for, for our clients. So the first one I'd like to point out is, is quality assurance. So this really is around um, the sort of controls and, and so on to make sure that that product is going to get there in, in good condition uh, first time and every time. So Biker operates a quality management system that controls everything that we do. Um, that um, involves training, uh, CAPA um, feedback and, and so on. Um, we obviously operate a GDP network, as I've mentioned, and provide quality oversight um, of, of every process. One of the key differentiators of us as well is we can provide advice and uh, support um, and validation of any um, import or export regulations. So this is quite um, attractive to our clients. Um, they, they may have um, uh, regulatory departments who, who can advise them or, or outsource regulatory information, but it's often quite useful to, to validate that with actually um, a logistics partner. So um, who, who can advise on the latest sort of issues that are, that are happening live in, in, in that particular port or in that particular destination. Uh, another key area that we provide to our cell and gene therapy clients is um, dummy routing. So we may, um, on, for, say for instance, a, a clinical study, we would um, do some test shipments before um, actually shipping live material to make sure that when that uh, live material was transported, um, that it would everything had been um, mapped out and, and tested before. Um, we also provide lane mapping um, and procedures for, for clinical work. So we specify exactly how the shipment will proceed right from uh, collection time through to um, packaging to be used, um, any specific requirements that may be required on each different site to the specific flights and, and, and times um, right from collection through to delivery. So there's a clearly um, mapped procedure to follow. Uh, moving on to traceability, this is another key uh, area um, and really this is all around the chain of identity and how this is managed. So this um, is obviously on, uh, on a patient ID level or, or, or product ID level and again how that is um, checked to make sure that that's maintained throughout the shipment. Um, also to make sure that the package isn't uh, tampered with during shipment. Um, we would use for instance serialized tags and record that information so there's that clear uh, chain of custody and, and chain of identity throughout the transport. Um, during each shipment, we provide an active monitoring um, service as standards, and this is across all of our shipments, not just cell and gene therapy shipments, where we have uh, a, a core team actually tracking and making sure that each shipment um, maintains it or hits its, its um, agreed milestones. For cell and gene therapies we, and, and other shipments where required, we will also utilise um, GPS devices where required, and that um, allows us to have live uh, up-to-date um, information on the, the, for instance, the temperature, the orientation, and obviously location of, of the specific package. Um, these these devices are, are flight safe, meaning that they don't generally um, uh, record, or sorry, not record, they don't generally transmit when they are actually on an aircraft, although they do record. Um, however, at all other points in the transit, we can access this information. We can also provide um, this type of uh, information to, to the clients as well, so they can also have live visibility on all of their shipments should they wish. Um, also around customer or consignee notifications, um, we can, because we provide a, a tailored and bespoke service, we can um, change this for individual client or, or consignee or clinic needs. And this is a, another key differentiator of ours. When it comes to packaging, uh, we provide um, validated and um, preconditioned packaging at point of collection and we actually provide or are able to provide a, a packaging service as well and this is another uh, key thing that our, our clients uh, in, enjoy. Um, so part of our contact review process would be um, determining exactly what your product requirements were, what size, what temperature, um, what the routing was, how long the 
um, specific uh, validation of that box would need to be and we can then provide advice and uh, guidance on the best packaging to use and then also source or, and supply that packaging for you. Um, many of the types of packaging that we use have to be preconditioned before so that may be for instance a liquid nitrogen dewer that needs to be pre-charged with LN2 or uh, a refrigerated or, or controlled ambient shipper with the phase change material needing to be kept and preconditioned at the right temperature and that's something we can provide so that, that preconditioned package is, is ready for collection at any of our locations or any location in the world uh, ready to, to collect your valuable samples. And we're also able to provide uh, packaging qualifications, and this is something that a number of um, specifically cell and gene companies are interested in at the moment. And we've completed a number of these whereby they have to um, document the, the control of their supply chains. And, and part of that is, is a qualification of the specific packaging used on, on that specific route. And that's something we can provide advice and, and support with as well. Um, with regards to routing, um, for clinical material, we provide both primary and uh, secondary routing and fallback options as well. Um, obviously, with the, the current COVID situation, the number of flights um, fl departing around the world has, has greatly reduced. So th this is quite key to, to having the, the different backup options and having clearly documented plans in the case that the, the primary routing can't be met. Um, as, as I say, the, the COVID situation has impacted the, the specialist logistics market because there are, are now less flights available. We're still managing to transport everything um, at, as required. It just is more challenging because there, there are less flights around. So it may sometimes affect uh, cutoffs and, and required collection times. Um, we also provide uh, issue resolution and, and backup planning, um, as well as um, selection and control of, of the, the use of suppliers. So making sure that we use our, um, our experience and um, agreements that we have with, with various suppliers to make sure that they are, are trained and used to handling uh, gene therapy material. Um, also as well, depending on the, the specific routing, so if you were shipping in from Ireland into, um, into the US or, or into the UK perhaps, we can provide realistic timeframes and um, that, that may possibly influence decision making on how you set up your, your manufacturing process. It may influence things such as the temperature that you transport um, samples at, be that fresh or frozen for instance, um, and, and we can provide support and guidance on that to, to assist you. So it, it's important to, to involve companies such as ourselves um, as early on in the process as possible so that you're not caught out with um, with any, any any particular routing issues and that, that's everything from me at the moment Jan thank you that, that that's really helpful uh Chris and I think it's clear from from that is that to reach out to you early you know ahead of uh, time just to see what services you offer and, and there's a, a wealth of expertise there uh for shipping these sensitive samples I've i early days it uh back in the lab, you know, frustrating that samples didn't arrive on time uh, or in the right, um, at the right temperature, should I say, and, and, and that can be many months or years or, or even, you know, irreplaceable samples. So, um, and thanks for that. Um, and you can reach out to Christopher as well, um, either through um, the chat or um, his details were, were there in the slides, which we can share as well. Um, so in, in the interest of time, I think we, 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 we don't have too much um, longer left. So um, our final panellist is, is Alan Stitt. So I'm hoping, Alan, you can, um, I guess, help wrap up as well as really reflect from your experience, well, building on your experience in regenerative op ophthalmology, but some of the challenges and opportunities that um, of translating from the bench to patients, uh, you know, how can we bring these therapies into the commercial space? Um, we've already heard about that potentially in Northern Ireland, there may be a, um, a need for additional technical skills and facilities, but is there anything else? Um, that you yeah, thanks. Add? I'll, I'll try to add something I'll, and I'll be really brief because I know that we need a bit of time for, for questions and answers. But I, I guess what I would say from the Queen's perspective is that we have a lot of a very basic science activity in the cell and gene therapy space across lots of different areas. Most of these researchers are doing actually in, in many in many ways it's very high quality basic science, but it is translationally orientated and many of them are focused on on some key diseases right across many areas such as respiratory disease and wound healing, you know, critical limb ischemia and, and of course ophthalmology. 
I think that one of the, the challenges for those basic scientists is, is to see, you know, what the opportunity is for them to advance their basic science and to actually start to think about taking steps towards translation. And, and that does really represent quite a big challenge for Oh, seem to have lost Alan. Oh, Alan, we lost today. you. Can you hear me okay? We, we can now. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we, we lost you at steps towards translation, I think. So, so really thinking about um, accessing some of that knowledge. Um, yes. Yeah, so really it's it's trying to access some of that knowledge. I think one of the deficiencies that we have had, certainly in my experience, is accessing some of these larger networks where we have people who have been successful in translating their basic science into the clinic. Actually, you know, learning from their experience. And it, it, it's good to hear that Francesca has, you know, really reached out and, and provided us with some opportunities to join the, you know, the network that she's developing there. We have recently joined the Northern Alliance Advanced Therapies Treatment Centre. Um, it's early days for that for us, uh, but I think that we're going to get some value from being part of that network as well with, with academic, academic partnerships, but of course also uh, some industrial partnerships. And, and I think it's really a matter of trying to see those connections, you know, understand where the the opportunities lie. I, I think Christina has encapsulated where we are right now in some of our basic science and that we have felt compelled to form a, a spin out company in order to take those next steps. Because actually, I think we find it hard to connect into the MRC hubs and to actually get that public funding to move our, our, our basic science and our preclinical evidence into something that can be translated into the clinic. We, we have tried very hard and we have had actually really helpful uh, help from the cell and gene therapy catapult. But I think in the end, what we felt was to move this to the next stage, we needed to form that spin out and, and Christina is moving that forward. Um, I think it's just one example, but hopefully as, as things mature in Northern Ireland and of course, across Ireland as well, you know, there will be more opportunities and, and more I suppose directions and pathways that people can follow to in order to translate their their work, both into uh, you know the clinic, but also into commercial success as well. Uh, thank, thanks, Alan. I, I think that that's a, a really great summary. Uh, Francesca, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, um, I'm delighted to hear that you guys have joined the Northern Alliance and the Northern Alliance is one of the organization we also reached out uh, and um, <clears throat> I think across uh, the piece there are a lot of uh, different uh, networks and collaborations that are being shaped. Uh, uh, so the Northern Alliance links the North plus uh, also a little bit of Scotland, but then you have the Scottish uh, um, network, Scottish enterprises, and we really try to uh, reach to all of them because um, they all address dif uh, slightly different pieces, like uh, more the, clean, the, the ATTCs, for instance, with whom we also work. Um, reached more across to the clinical side and um, so it's many of us and as I said we are trying to build a network of networks each of these networks have a, a very specific value but if we put all of them together and uh, we really can do something unique. Fantastic Francesca. Um, one of the things I guess I'm conscious of, we've, we've spoken about ophthalmology. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Danny or others on the panel can reflect if there are other particular strengths in Northern Ireland, just so we managed to bring those out. We've also um, heard from um, Christina as well at Vasque Versa, which I guess is uh, across multiple diseases. But are there, I know, Danny, you're in the respiratory field. Would you like to just reflect on, on the work that you've been doing and the particular sort of strengths there? Uh, thanks, Joanne. So, I mean, obviously, the eye is the second most important uh, organ after the lung. Uh, you know, so uh, I mean, I, I guess it is one of our um, our, our challenges as well that um, we, we probably are relatively niche. And as um, Alan alludes to, we we really do have, I think, very impressive um, expertise in ophthalmology. <coughs> 
Um, likewise, in severe respiratory failure in the critically ill, we have a, a you know a pipeline of, of um, basic science translating into uh, clinical trials and, and back translation. Um, so, so I guess there are our strengths. I, I think there are areas that we um, really, as as our academic institutions, need to to push. For example, you know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the in the cancer space that we're not yet um, taking advantage of. So, um, I think we have strong um, expertise in, in in some areas, and uh, you know, eyes and, and lungs are are clearly where our strengths are currently, but it would be nice to develop that into all the other emerging areas. And, and as, as Alan also alludes to, we really have a broad range of clinical academics where, who, who may not have the um, basic science knowledge to, to bring their own um, product uh, through to translation, but would be able to facilitate in collaboration testing of therapies in a whole range of disease areas. So I think um, you maximizing the, the, the interaction of, of clinical academics with cell therapy and uh, more basic researchers and, and companies is a, a, an important challenge as well. Yep, yeah, um, thank you, Danny. I, I think that um, that's a, a real space uh, and it speaks to what's come up uh, repeatedly here with uh, you know, visibility, just creating that network uh, that, that moves right away from discovery and, and, and the technologies in order to deliver gene therapies right the way through to the delivered products. And I think one of the things that um, I'm keen to do as well is whilst um, this is very much in the sort of the academic and the therapeutic space. There are also something, and it's not for this um, meeting, um, but to highlight uh, some of the strengths in manufacturing and whether or not there are advanced manufacturing uh, insights and knowledge in Northern Ireland that can actually move this field forward. And so um, that that may well be um, for another webinar, but but uh, it's important to join those dots and there are insights that we can get right from the manufacturing side that may feed into to the early discovery and, and commercialization phases that, that can help. And I think, Joanna, just to come back, I think that's an important point. <clears throat> you know, I picked up Christina mentioning that, you know, we don't have a manufacturing facility, so we've got a cell therapy facility, which does not yet have a manufacturing license. And I guess what would, really drive the need for us to invest in that manufacturing uh, capability would be uh, activity. Um, you know, so, so knowing that the need is there would uh, really drive our commitment then to uh, investing locally in, in you know, the staff that are required to do that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a really nice place to, to end it off uh, and see that we're to time. So um, thank you, everyone. That leaves me just to thank our panel uh, and audience members for joining us today and also Maeve Murphy and Kerry McCormack for, for uh, their organisation slides and, and, and teams superior abilities. And also thanks to our sponsor, Biocare, uh, uh, for today. And I think I guess three clear uh, pieces uh, come come uh, to mind here from, from what's been said is that we do have the facilities, but we may not have um, the skills or some of the regulatory or licensing expertise to, to, to carry out what we need. So that's something we can look at, but obviously all of those involve investment, uh, but, but the clear piece is um, that we can start working on now is creating that knowledge network and the visibility externally um, really to, to pull the group together in Northern Ireland and access some of that expertise um, that exists uh, across the network within the UK and even further afield um, into Ireland and, and globally. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for today. Um, it's been fantastic um and, and good great participation from our panel members um there will be a recording of this available hopefully in the next few days and some feedback there um, but i hope this is only the start of the conversation um so thank you everybody thanks Joanne. thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. bye